want to talk about a much more specific um, problem and a much more specific piece of, of work about the um, an evolutionary model of uh, how evolution can support uh, cooperation in public goods kinds of settings. Uh, and this is work I've done with uh, Herb Gintis and Sam Bowles, who are economists who uh, I've worked with off and on now for 10 years or so. Uh, <clears throat> and um, so the title is Coordinated Contingent Punishment is Group Beneficial and Can Increase in Rare. Um, that's my claim, and I'll explain what these pictures are in a second. Um, so I want to start with the, what I think is one of the big problems in human evolution, which is the, the fact that humans are a lot more cooperative than uh, other primates, for sure, and, and most other mammals. I think uh, there's really only one competitor amongst the mammals. Um, and so if you compare humans to other, um, to other mammals, uh, you see things that uh, are um, provision of public goods on various scales. So uh, even the simplest human societies are, um, it, well, especially the simplest human societies, depend on food sharing. So in uh, virtually all hunter-gatherer societies that have been studied, there, there are a couple of exceptions, but in almost all of them, uh, all the food that's brought back to camp is shared amongst uh, whoever is there. Um, some societies, like the Aceh, actually have norms that um, prescribe the hunter, the man who kills the, the game, from actually consuming it. He must share what he, what he eats with, with others. Um, even more impressive, I think, is um, conflict between groups. So intergroup conflict is something that is um, omnipresent in human societies. Um, and uh, there are uh, good historical data that even hunter-gatherer societies manage uh, war parties on the scale of several hundred people. Um, uh, and uh, they manage to enforce peace, which I think is more interesting. I think hunter-gatherer warfare is limited by logistics uh, to reasonably small armies, reasonably small war parties. But um, there's good evidence that peace is, is, is extended on larger scales, particularly sort of ethno-linguistic scales. Um, Almost all human societies depend on help for the sick and injured. Um, Larry Sugiyama, who's an anthropologist at, uh, at Oregon, has measured uh, the extent to which um, a hunter uh, horticulturalist in eastern Ecuador, the Achuar, are injured. And by the time you're 70 years old, almost all men have spent at least a month being fed by somebody else, whether they had a broken leg or a sprained ankle or some such thing. Um, uh, if you, my wife's a primatologist, Joan Silk, and if you go out to a baboon group, you find uh, a baboon with a serious injury. It's quite common, um, especially due to conflict amongst baboons, but also due to falls and such. Um, no one's helping them. They're, they're making it on their own. Uh, there was a baboon uh, one time <coughs> during one of her studies that had a compound fracture of its forelimb. Uh, when the group moved, uh, that baboon just had to keep up. Um, <coughs> we have uh, conflict and, and, and uh, resources of various kinds managed by by culturally transmitted norms that are enforced by third parties. So one of the things that distinguishes human populations from others, I think, is that uh, people have an interest in other, they, they're nosy, they keep uh, interest in other people's business, and they're willing to sanction people who don't follow uh, the rules. Uh, and then um, low-cost communication, I'm going to skip that. That's a, uh, well, I'll just skip it. So, uh, you know, this has been a subject that a lot of people have written about, uh, beginning with Darwin, actually, in Chapter 5 of, of The Descent of Man. Um, uh, and um, uh, lately, uh, there's been a lot of attention to the role of punishment, uh, that uh, uh, cooperation in public good settings is enforced by, by uh, mutually enforced punishment. Um, so it's, it's obvious that if defectors are punished, so if we have a public good situation where everyone can contribute, uh, contributions are costly, uh, there's a public benefit, so there's a profit. There, each contribution produces more benefit to the group. Uh, then uh, selection, unless uh, individuals are related, won't favor cooperation in that setting. But if individuals who don't contribute are punished, uh, and if the punishment is sufficient to motivate them to do so, then they'll cooperate. Of course, we still have to explain why people should punish. And this has two advantages over um, as an explanation for the evolution of cooperation over um, selection favoring cooperation. The first of which is, um, unlike reciprocity, where I'll cooperate as long as you cooperate, um, punishment can be targeted at specific individuals. So reciprocity works fine in pairs. Uh, 
Uh, so if Steve and I, for example, were in a, in a pairwise uh, long-term reciprocal interaction, which is kind of what we're in, um, uh, if he did something bad, I could then not help him the next time. Um, but if the whole bunch of us are in a cooperative interaction, uh, going off in a war party or, um, or hunting or something like that, um, and somebody is a coward and stands behind a tree once the, the bullets start flying, um, uh, the rule, I'm going to cooperate if the next time, as long as everyone else cooperated last time, means that all the others who weren't cowards are punished by the same act. So direct punishment, uh, taking people out and administering some kind of direct punishment to them, has the advantage it can be targeted directly at individuals, so it works equally well in large groups and in pairs. The other thing is the punishment's a deterrent. So if we have repeated interactions and somebody is punished, uh, then, uh, and it's sufficient to, to mean that it's not worth defecting anymore, then um, the next time around, the threat of punishment will be sufficient to create cooperation. So a system of punishment that's working well can actually end up doing very little punishing because the deterrent is enough to uh, create the incentive to um, cooperate, and then if everyone cooperates, no one needs to be punished. So all that's needed is the believable threat that someone is going to be punished. So the maintenance of cooperation by punishment is much easier than um, cooperation alone. Um, this last fact means it's much easier to maintain punishment. Uh, the so-called second-order free rider problem is, um, uh, okay, fine, punishment can enforce cooperation, but punishment is costly. Uh, uh, how, why should selection favor individuals who punish? Um, uh, I'm not going to go into that. I think that's fairly easily solved, and the solutions rely on the fact that um, punishment is, um, it, when the system is working, uh, is much less costly than the cooperation which it induces. Okay, so there's lots of ethnographic evidence. Uh, so I'm an anthropologist. I'm interested in cooperation in small-scale societies. Um, uh, and there's lots of ethnographic evidence that cooperation of various <coughs> kinds is, is, is um, um, created by uh, uh, various kinds of sanctions. So Polly Wiesner, who is uh, an anthropologist at the University <coughs> of Utah, has a wonderful series of recent papers about um, gossip amongst the Kung, this uh, group of famous hunter-gatherers that lives on the border of, of Botswana and Namibia. And uh, uh, she has very nice data that people who are um, stingy or in some other way violate uh, social norms regarding cooperation are gossiped about and that the gossip has consequences for people's um, uh, social interactions. So they, they're, they're less well liked by their friends and neighbors. And if they need help, for example, in a, di in a, di a dyadic interaction, um, they're less likely to get it. Um, <clears throat> another recent uh, study is by Joe Henrik, who works, he and I work on an island in, um, in the Fijian group. And we've, um, well, we've worked there. Joe has done this particular piece of work, um, uh, recorded histories of, um, of norm violations of various kinds. Uh, so somebody breaks into the nurse's office and steals alcohol. Uh, somebody doesn't do their job, so every year some, you have to plant the chief's, chief's yams. Um, somebody doesn't work very hard when, on the day that the chief's yams are supposed to be planted. Um, what ha we've, we've recorded what happens to those people, and then we've done what are called vignette experiments in, in, um, in anthropology, where you tell a story. So we, Joe has reported about 20 instances of actual punishment. And then you tell people stories about violations. Uh, and you ask them what would happen to that person. So you can collect a lot more data that way. The results are consistent. And that is that you get a graded series of, of punishments. When people break rules, um, the first thing that happens is you start talking bad about them. The next thing that happens is um, you withdraw social support. And in the Fijian village, this is mainly the form of mutual vigilance. So people live in grass houses, and um, they're, you're uh, subject to predators all the time. So if someone you're out in the garden or you're out fishing, uh, someone's going to come into your house and take stuff. And um, normally, your neighbors watch after you. But if you've done something bad, uh, they may look the other way while someone, um, uh, and then that person can do that without themselves being subject to punishment. And eventually, you get corporal punishment. This is quite rare, but uh, the fellow who did break into the nurse's office and steal the alcohol was taken out and beaten by um, 
several of the older men. Um, and finally, ostracism. If, if somebody's bad enough, this happened once, um, they're asked to leave. OK. Um, so models suggest that punishment is a good way of, of supporting cooperation. You can get punishment to evolve, um, at least to be stable. Um, and uh, ethnic, lots of ethnographic evidence suggests that's the way human societies work. Uh, there have been lately two related objections to this kind of explanation. The first one is that um, it's hard to get punishment to increase when rare. So if you have genes that, that give people a, a, a taste for punishment, if you want to think about it that way, or if you have cultural variants, culturally transmitted ideas about what your obligations are in terms of punishment, if those things are driven by, if the evolution of those things is driven by payoffs, um, it's, once punishment gets common, uh, it doesn't cost too much to administer it because it, it keeps people in line and it produces big benefits. But when it's rare, when there aren't very many punishers around, then it costs a lot to administer and it's not very effective. So, um, uh, and there's been a lot of work on this area and it's, it's so far, uh, I'm gonna give you an exception in a few minutes, People haven't come up with a, with a plausible way, I don't think, to get punishment increasing when rare. Um, the other thing is, is that a, there's been a bunch of experiments, mainly by uh, uh, people in Cambridge, Massachusetts, uh, Martin Novak and others, uh, showing that in experimental public goods game settings, um, uh, punishment works all right. It makes people cooperative. But the cost of administering punishment exceeds the additional benefits that are produced. Um, and uh, so the argument is uh, that Novak and, and his co-authors have made is that uh, punishment is not, um, you know, given the reality of human uh, psychology and in public good situations, um, uh, it, it just doesn't produce enough benefit. So um, <coughs> so but there's two, uh, artificialities uh, in um, the models, all the models that have been done so far uh, of the evolution of punishment. Um, and all but one of the experiments implement, this is a case where maybe models have been too influential because people make models and then they, people fix up the experiments so that they're just like the model world instead of the real world. <laughs> and um, so uh, all the models implement punishment as an uncoordinated individual interaction. So the way the typical model works is uh, there's a series of stages. In each stage, individuals can make a choice whether to cooperate or defect in a public goods game. And then the next stage, they can make a choice whether or not to punish defectors or anybody else. And, um, and, so, and these decisions are made without uh, being contingent on what other individuals are going to do. So uh, they're contingent on whether there's been a defection or not. But in the, the punishers don't, in any sense, get together and decide how much to punish, uh, decide um, how much damage to do, how much to spend, so on like that. And there's quite a bit of evidence, I think, that uh, ethnographically, that uh, punishment actually is not like that at all. It's almost always coordinated. People get together, the potential punishers, and they decide what they're going to do. Uh, um, this is a little bit of PR for one of my students. Uh, this is Sarah Matthew. Previous Princeton undergraduate, Simon. Undergraduate. You probably know her. Um, uh, so worked with Jean Altman when she was at Princeton. Um, uh, Sarah uh, is a terrific student. Anybody who's got a job for a physical anthropologist, I uh, highly recommend her. But anyway, um, she has been studying um, warfare amongst the uh, Turkana. Uh, these are a group of people who live on the border between, uh, well, mainly in Kenya, but the very north edge of Kenya. Uh, if you've seen The Constant Gardener, uh, the movie, uh, the uh, Lokichokyo, which is um, <coughs> where some of the scenes in that movie are set, uh, was at that time the, the main uh, uh, the jumping off point for aid to southern Sudan. Uh, almost all of that's moved to Juba now um, because the Sudan has calmed down. <coughs> but all around Lokichokyo, there are um, Turkana uh, uh, pastoralists. Uh, they number about 500,000 people. They're subsistence pastoralists. They are fully nomadic. They move from place to place. And um, uh, they uh, do uh, a lot of cattle raiding. So groups of Turkana will get together in quite large groups. This is uh, groups numbering around uh, the, the mean number in her sample is 300 men. Um, uh, these are men, many of whom don't know each other at all. They come from numerous 
both age groups, so the Draconia are, are organized into a series of age groups, and also organized uh, uh, cross purposes to that into territorial sections. Um, without going into all the details, uh, this is not a clan of men who v v live and fight together for, for years and years and years. Somebody will let it be known that a, that a, um, that a war party is being organized. Um, uh, the word will go out, rendezvous at such and such a time, place, men assemble, and they go off to raid, always outside the Turkana. So um, uh, it's very interesting. There's a half a million Turkana, but uh, if you were to raid a Turkana, that would be stealing, be extremely heavily punished. But if you go raid, raid the Taposas, who are their, one of their neighbors, um, so you hike 100 kilometers, 50 or 100 kilometers, um, and then uh, <coughs> armed with AK-47s these days, um, you um, shoot up a Taposa settlement and run off with uh, a few thousand cows. Um, there's no formal institutions of either command and control or of recruitment or punishment. Uh, none, and there are lots of opportunities for free riding. Uh, so um, you can get halfway there and decide you have a stomach ache. You can get there and you can stand behind a tree or keep your head down when the shooting starts. After the cows are, if you're successful and you manage to, to extract some cows from the Taposa village, um, uh, it's complicated, but basically uh, a bunch of guys will drive the cows off and then some more guys have to stay behind and uh, keep the Taposas at bay while you make distance, put distance between you and, and the previous owners of these cows. And um, the guys who take the cows away are often tempted, and sometimes do, um, just keep going. And they don't wait for the people who are doing the, the rear guard action. And uh, so they end up with the cows uh, not having done the, the scariest thing. So, and these things happen. Sarah has very good data on, on um, about 110 um, raiding parties. Uh, uh, free riding does happen, um, and of all these kinds. And it's punished. And it's punished in the following way. Um, the, the, the person who's, um, who's been there's really no adjudication procedure here. Someone is, is it's decided by his age mates and the community that he was a coward, let's say. He hid behind a tree when the shooting started. Um, and then his age mates, this group of several, well, it might even be 10 or 15,000 people, um, some subset of them get together and they decide whether or not this person should be punished. Um, there, there are mitigating circumstances. Um, they discuss whether those are sufficient. And then um, if they are, they decide on a penalty. And uh, this ranges from forcing him to pay a fine, basically he has to slaughter a cow and hold a feast, to um, very severe beatings uh, in which people are nearly killed. Uh, and this is, so a group of age mates, these might be, some of them are friends of his, take him out, they tie him to a tree, and they uh, beat him to a so, um, and this is Sarah, this is a Turkana, and that's Sarah doing her, um, this is the method of doing research. You, you, you find men who are returned from war parties and uh, interview them about what happened. <coughs> okay, so notice here what's, it's not a bunch of people independently deciding whether or not to punish. It's a group of potential punishers uh, deciding whether or not to punish and then coordinating the amount of, of punishment. So um, Sam and Herb and I um, had the idea, and it's a, a long story. If, uh, the actual history behind this is, is sort of tortured and, and probably doesn't bear repeating. But anyway, finally we came to the idea that uh, we were interested in, um, in trying to build an evolutionary model of the usual kind in which there was a public goods interaction and then a possibility of punishment. This is repeated, so there can be <coughs> contingent punishment. But now building into it the idea that punishment is coordinated, that the punishers somehow get together and agree on how much punishment to administer and, um, and then administer it cooperatively. Um, so here's how the model works. Um, this is a typical evolutionary game theory model. We have large groups, uh, groups of N. This is, this is the interaction group sampled from a large population. Um, at first, we're going to sample them randomly. Later on, we're going to sample them a little assortively so that uh, that's equivalent to uh, individuals interacting with people to whom they're related. So every interaction has three stages. 
First, there's a cooperation stage, so individuals can produce a benefit to every other member of the group of the n individuals. So every other individual gets a benefit b over n. Um, so the total benefit produced by an individual act is b at a cost c. Um, individuals can signal their willingness to punish, and that is not free. It costs them an amount q. Okay, so individuals are, are going to be able to signal their intent to punish, but that, that they have to ante up some money, and that's q. <coughs> and finally, let's say a bit about the nature of these signals. What's going on? Um, well, in the model, it's just a signal. Uh, in real life, I mean, it's, um, say, being initiated in one of these age groups uh, that, um, you know, you have to be circumcised or something like that, that means that you're then, um, have agreed to do this. Okay. Now, we'll allow liars, individuals who, who you know, suffer the punishment, who pay the cost, but then don't pay the cost subsequently of actually punishing. So they, 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 um, they'll say, yes, I'm willing to be a member of this age group. Yes, I'm willing to have that old man come after me with a rusty knife. Um, yeah, but when the time comes, I don't actually put up. Okay? But that's, okay. that's coming down the line. Okay? Um, and um, so they administer a cost P. So that's the cost of the person being punished. And the cost to the punishers is, um, is going to be amount K divided by the number of punishers raised to a power. So the, the number A is going, to be a, is going to be a number greater than, well, greater than or equal to 1. If it's 1, then all that adding more punishers does is just divide up the cost amongst the individuals doing the punishing. There's no economies of scale. If A is bigger than 1, then more punishers mean it's cheaper per punisher to do the punishing. No, I, should, I didn't say that right. It's cheaper for, it, the, the total cost is reduced as the number of punishers increase. Um, my own sense from reading, I mean, these are just stories and anecdotes, is uh, there's a huge advantage. The cost of administering the punishment goes down very rapidly as the number of punishers increase. So if 20 guys tie you to a tree, there's really not that much you can do uh, to, um, to fight back. OK, so finally then, then the interaction goes on the usual way at a constant probability of termination uh, and such that the average number of interactions is capital T. So first, let's consider two strategies, punishers and non-punishers. The punishers, remember, during the first stage, they don't cooperate. Then they signal their willingness to punish. And then they punish everyone who doesn't signal uh, and who doesn't cooperate and doesn't signal. So they punish both non-cooperators and individuals who, who, um, who uh, uh, don't signal their willingness to cooperate in the punishment. Um, Punishers don't cooperate, they don't signal, and they don't punish. <coughs> and then in subsequent interactions, oh, I shouldn't say that. I, I, I jumped a step. So if there, there's this number tau, and this is going to be the, the number that, that is the central number in the punishing strategy. If I look out and I see tau, if I'm a punisher, and I see tau other individuals willing to punish, and they've signaled with that, then I punish. If it's less than that, I pay the cost of the signal, and I don't actually punish. So I make my punishment contingent on how many punishers are willing to, to go along with me and punish. Um, <coughs> so that's the, that's the contingent part. The coordinated part is we work together. Um, so I want you to notice here that there's, there's been a bunch of models of cooperation and punishment. And uh, a couple of years ago, Laurent Lehman and Laurent Keller and a couple other guys um, wrote a, a, a rather, say, pugna pugnacious article uh, arguing that all these punishment models are just uh, only work because there's uh, uh, in, what will be equivalent in a genetic model to, to complete linkage between the, the punishment strategy and the cooperation strategy. Um, and I'll come back to this at the end, but I want you to notice here that, that punishment is an inherited, I'm sure this should be, cooperation is not an inherited trait, it's a choice. It's, I used to say in my daughter's preschool. Actually, they would often say it's not a choice when the kids want to do something bad. But so cooperation is a choice. Every individual chooses whether or not to cooperate, depending on whether uh, they're going to get punished for not doing it or not. Okay, so defectors get punished uh, if there are enough punishers around, and so 
uh, defectors have to make an assessment. Individuals, both, all the, both the punishing types and the non-punishing types, have to make an assessment. Are there enough punishers in this group that it's worth, that, that they're going to punish, and I have to, I have to uh, go along with this cooperative deal? Does that uh, distinguish uh, these species from uh, other organisms like ants, for example? Um, well, ants have punishment, actually. And bees and ants have um, uh, enforcement of, of social norms. But I think the reason it works is a completely different one. So it's not contingent on, um, so this, this is going to work, you'll see, even though the relatedness among some groups of are random, there's no relatedness at all in these groups. Um, uh, uh, people like Francis Ratnex and others uh, who studied punishment in social insects um, uh, are convinced, I guess I'm convinced by them, that that mainly runs on, on um, uh, relatedness, occlusive fitness kinds of, of uh, so, so in this kind of setting, you wouldn't get any punishment. Uh, uh, so the mechanisms that the evolutionary mechanisms that create punishment in, in social insects are different than the ones that I'm. So this is a repeated interaction. So individuals, um, the punishing individuals, if they're going to evolve, are going to have to evolve because are going to have to they're going to have to induce enough cooperative behavior that they're compensated over the multiple inter, uh, periods of this interaction by cooperative behavior of others to pay them for the cost of punishing. Okay, do you see what I'm saying? Okay, so this is just, uh, maybe this is a little bit too much inside baseball, but, but um, uh, this model does, it, it, there is no linkage whatsoever between uh, punishment and, uh, and cooperation, and we'll see punishment evolves quite nicely. <coughs> okay, so the novel features of the model is the punishment's coordinated, there are economies of scale, and the punishment only occurs if there's, a, if there's um, um, a given number of punishers. So this is a little bit like the quorum sensing um, mo uh, cooperation models you see in microorganisms. Yes. This may be a foolish question. Is there a distribution of tau among members of the population? Or is it um, okay, so uh, there's going to be just one type, and, and everyone's going to have, there's going to be guys who have no non-punishers, and there's going to be guys that just have Everyone has the same value of tau. Now, it's a very good question. You'll see it's my last slide, basically. Uh, what, I mean, so this is a kind of typical game theory model where we take these fixed strategies. What would happen if there was a little bit of fuzziness in what tau is? Um, uh, I got my ideas, but I, I have no results about that. So, so uh, and you'll, you'll, they're good, as you'll see, there are good reasons to be a little worried about that as, we, as I'll, I'll, I'll go through the, the model. Okay, so um, uh, the parameters matter. Sometimes you get the idea they don't, but uh, so the cost is just that we can pick just for, um, for uh, that just sets the units of fitness here. I'm going to set the benefit so it's only twice the cost. So that's really crummy public good, right? So that means, for example, that would only be favored if, amongst full SIBs if it was kin selection driving. This is not much benefit. Um, the punishment has to be bigger than the cost of cooperating, otherwise no one's going to cooperate, so I'm going to make P one and a half uh, uh, C, and K, the cost of a single individual administering punishment is the same as the cost of punishing. Um, the cost of signaling is the same as the cost of being punished. Uh, I've got some economies of scale. Um, oh, there are errors, so throughout this period, people, individuals who mean to cooperate sometimes defect by mistake. They have to be punished too, because you can't distinguish them from from, um, and that's very important in models. You can get a lot of cooperation and punishment to evolve if you assume a noise-free world in which, um, because then punishment is free once it becomes common. Okay, so you need some set, set of noise that cause, so even when you get near equilibrium, the, the punishers still have to do a little punishing. So I'm gonna assume 10% uh, error rate, which in a group of 18, that's a sort of hunter-gatherer sized group, uh, means that on average something like uh, almost two individuals are, are defecting by mistake each time period. And 25 time periods, so think of this in the terms of, of warfare. The Turkana, for example, uh, in a man's life, uh, the average number of, of war parties that he goes on is something like 25. So men fight from, their, from about age 20 to about age 45. Sometimes it might be 60. Uh, some guys might only go to 15. But, so this is a kind of, this is a kind of, this is not something like food sharing, for which the number would be hundreds or 
or other kinds of, of altruistic interactions which occur more frequently. Okay, so here's the results. So, so far we've only got two strategies, so we're just looking at the evolution of the frequency of one of them. I'm going to keep track of the equilibrium frequency of the punishing type. So up here the population is all punishers, and down here it's all non-punishers. And this is the, the threshold that the punishers use to um, administer, to govern whether they punish or not. So down at this end you've got guys, so here at zero you've got guys that always punish, and here you've got guys who only punish if every other single individual in the group punishes. <coughs> okay, the red dots are stable equilibria and the blue dots are unstable equilibria. So in a, when groups are formed at random, non-punishing is always evolutionarily stable. A population of all non-punishers can resist invasion by uh, punishers. Um, but uh, above a certain threshold, so in this case it's two, um, this is actually with the parameters I showed you, there's a second equilibrium in which you end up with a mix of punishers and non-punishers. Okay? So there's two stable states for all thresholds bigger than, than, uh, than two, and we'll see that varies depending on the parameters. <clears throat> okay, how to understand this? I, I think, you know, this is a very simple model. It's got a bunch of artificialities in it. But I think it, ha it does produce an interesting insight about how this whole system can work. And the way, I think the way to see that is to think about these threshold groups. So groups in which there are tau plus one punishers, only in those groups does the marginal punisher get a benefit. Groups that are smaller than that, individual signal, they pay the cost of signaling, punisher signal, they pay the cost of signaling, and uh, nobody cooperates, they just lose, okay? Groups bigger than that, each punisher could switch to a non-punisher and increase their fitness because they're supernumeraries, right? They, there are more punishers than you need to guarantee long-term cooperation. They're gonna punish the errors, they're gonna get no more extra cooperation, so it's only in these threshold groups that punishers have an advantage. Okay, now that doesn't sound very promising, but I think, it, I'm going to show you a graph here, I think it explains why the model generates um, a, a mixed equilibrium. Okay, so I'm going to walk through this. Okay, so over here, this is a graph of the fitness, let me get out of the way of the graph, this is a, a, a graph of the difference between the fitness of a punisher and the fitness of a non-punisher averaged over all the groups. And on the horizontal axis is the frequency of punishers. <coughs> it has a shape like this. This is one equilibrium, an unstable one. That's a stable equilibrium. That's another stable equilibrium. Let's see why it has that shape. So let's just pick arbitrarily 10% frequency of punishers. I should get back that thing so I can stand. Okay, so 10% of punishers. The, the histogram is the distribution of group frequencies. So uh, the most common group has one punisher in it uh, when 10% of the population is punishers. And the blue bars give the fraction of the groups with each composition, each number of punishers. Okay? The, with, so here we're looking at the evolution of punishers who require five other guys to go along with them before they'll punish. Tau equals five. So when the frequency of punishers is 10%, there aren't very many groups of that kind. It's only in this red marked group that punishers have an advantage. In all the other groups, they have a disadvantage. Okay? Now let's increase the frequency of punishment. So suppose it's about 30%. These, this is just a binomial distribution with n equals 18 and p equals whatever the frequency is. In this case, it's 0.3. So when it's 0.3, the most common group is, happens to be with these parameter values, is, is um, the threshold group. And that's when you get the maximum fitness benefit of being a punisher. When the, when the groups in which punishers have an advantage each punisher is necessary to sustain the long-term cooperation that pays punishers back. Um, 
Okay, but now we'll let the frequency increase some more. Actually, it would increase here because uh, the punishers have a higher uh, fitness. Eventually, the, the, the distribution keeps shifting over, and eventually the frequency of individuals in the threshold group drops to the point where they have the same fitness as, as the non-punishers in, in all the other groups. Okay? And then you have a balance of, you have a stable equilibrium. So uh, here's what, the, what those fitness curves look like for four different uh, thresholds. Uh, when tau is equal to one, I'll punish if one other guy punishes. It doesn't even pay in the threshold group. There aren't enough punishers to divide the cost among to, to, to get up. The benefits don't compensate you for the cost of punishing, so um, it, it, there's no frequency. But once you get the frequency high enough, then you have a series of equilibria, um, uh, an unstable one, which is the, is the minimum threshold before you have enough of the groups at the threshold so that punishers have an advantage. And then you go over the hump, and eventually um, you reach a situation in which the punishers um, uh, are, the benefits and costs of being a punisher are balanced. OK. So, pu so punishment is not altruistic in this model at all. It is, it is uh, at the, if you, if you, look at the equilibria, which have punishers in them, those mixed equilibria, um, those have higher fitness, average fitness, than the no punisher equilibria. On average, um, both types have the same fitness, of course, at any, any interior equilibrium like that. And that fitness is higher than they would achieve if um, they were all non-punishers. Okay, so there is a net benefit from punishment. Um, and there's no altruism here. This is. Uh, just individual self-interest. I can't tell you how long it took me to convince Sam Bowles that. But anyway, um, <coughs> uh, I'm sure I'm not completely convinced. I've got him convinced yet. But anyway, <coughs> okay. So this whole thing depends on um, we're a bunch of punishers. Who are we signaling? We're signaling each other. We're not signaling the defectors. They go ahead and defect. They don't pay attention to signal. They don't believe they're going to be punished until they're actually punished. But we're signaling to the other punishers that I am a punisher and I'm going to punish if you punish. And so the question is, what would happen if, um, how, how big does the cost of punishing have to be to keep the liars out, individuals who induce others to punish by saying they're going to punish uh, and then don't? So you introduce a strategy that, that signals but doesn't punish. And then later on, it cooperates, but it doesn't punish. Okay, so it acts like a non-punisher, except during the first period when it lies. It says, I'm going to punish. If you guys go ahead and punish, I'll help you, and then doesn't. Uh, you can show, actually, analytically, that, uh, that, uh, this, that the, um, so you look at that interior equilibrium with a mixture of punishers and non-punishers where there's some cooperation going on, and you ask, can rare liars invade that equilibrium? And the answer is, rare liars can invade only when the, uh, the cost of signaling is greater than the expected cost of being punished on the first turn. And um, uh, it turns out that this is very close to the cost of a single punishment act um, in most. But you liars lie all the time. Hmm? Liars defect all the time. No, liars, uh, they defect on the punishment part, not the cooperation part. So they defect on the punishment part all the time. Yeah. So you might have a situation where somebody says they could cooperate, and then cooperate sometimes, but not Yeah, no, so and, and I didn't consider those guys. But I think all that would do is scale the amount of, of uh, actually, I'm not sure. I won't speculate, but yeah, sir. Are non-punishers punished or non-signalers? Non-punishers are not punished. Not, but non-signalers. Non-signalers are punished in, during the first term. Um, but, but later on, you can put non-punishers in this model, and they don't, they don't, well, they're in the model, and they don't benefit because, it, because basically because in those marginal groups, they screw things up. And it's those marginal groups, I mean, that, that, that you lose the, the long-term benefits of cooperation in the marginal group. This is why the, the um, the liars don't prosper in this model because they lie 
And then cooperation collapses in, in the marginal groups, which are exactly those groups which are the key things to keeping punishment, making punishment pay. So there's no second order free rider problem here. Um, now, one thing I should say, I ma mainly picked the numbers to be hard on, on, on cooperation, but economies of scale are crucial. If you take the economies of scale away, um, not much happens. It's much harder to get cooperation to evolve. So this is with uh, no economies of scale. This is with the, what I showed you before. And um, the range of situations where you get cooperation is much, much smaller. Um, <coughs> now this is, I think, this is the biggest news, I think, of, of the model, which is, okay, so far it's a lot like other models. There's a, there's a stable situation in which punishment persists, and there's a, um, a situation in which non-punishers are, when non-punishers are common, they stay common. How do you get it started? And the answer is, um, a small amount of relatedness um, is enough to destabilize the non-punishment um, equilibrium. So this is the solution that um, Hamilton and Axelrod introduced in their famous science paper for uh, uh, the evolution of reciprocity. So reciprocity has exactly the same situation. Defe all defection is always evolutionarily stable. <coughs> Tit for tat is evolutionarily stable. But that's with random interaction. But add a little bit of assortment. So tit for tat individuals are a little more likely to interact with each other than chance alone would dictate. Something that would happen in a viscous population, a population that's spread out in space, in which uh, there's a lot of gene flow, but not, not complete mixing every generation, so you have a little background relatedness, and that leads <coughs> genes that give rise to tit for tat to be more likely to interact with tit for tat. So the same thing goes on here. So I'm assuming now that the correlation between uh, types when groups are formed is either 0 0.035 or 0 0.07. So that's relatedness values of 0 0.035 or 0 0.07. Um, these are two numbers, two dueling numbers for the uh, what we'd expect for human hunter-gatherer groups. So Sam Bowles published a paper in Science uh, a couple of years ago assembling data from hunter-gatherer groups mainly based on classical markers uh, which showed uh, R values around 0 0.07. Um, Linda Vigilant, who is a geneticist at the Max Planck Institute in Leipzig, has a much better data set, in my opinion, not in Sam's, um, uh, uh, a microsatellite data set from a large group of, of um, hunter-gatherers in Angola and another group in northern Australia. And the, the numbers she gets are about half of what, uh, what Sam got. And they're actually exactly the same that people get for chimpanzees in uh, in West Africa and at uh, Christoph Bosch's uh, site. Okay, so these are kind of reasonable numbers for relatedness. And now notice that for low thresholds, uh, there's only one equilibrium. The only stable equilibrium is a mix of cooperators and punishers. Um, the small amount of assortment is enough to destabilize the, um, the non-cooperative equilibrium, okay? just the same way it does with reciprocity. Um, What's my, t what am I, I, five, six minutes. five or six minutes, great. I'm sorry, you're the boss, okay. Um, group size doesn't matter very much here, this is very surprising. Um, so uh, we, we uh, change the parameters so that the groups are size 36 or size uh, 72. Um, notice that I've upped the benefit cost ratio here to four. With, with two, you don't get anything in groups of 36 and 72. But add a little bit more group benefit and you can get, um, um, uh, punishers to increase when rare with low levels of relatedness. This is vigilance data uh, estimate, not, not to bulls. <coughs> um, the rest of it are kind of uh, obvious things. If you make uh, cooperation more beneficial, you get more punishment. It's the benefits of cooperation that are paying the punishers for punishing. In those threshold groups, the <coughs> induced cooperation that only punishers get is what's compensating punishers throughout the population for uh, the cost of their punishment. So if you make punishment more um, beneficial, um, this curve shifts this way, uh, and you get more cooperation, more punishment. Um, if you make punishment more costly, you get less of it. Big surprise. So here's the assumption in the base case model. If you make it twice as costly for one individual to punish, 
another individual, you get less. If you make it half, but most of the models that have been done before now assume half or a quarter there, something like that. Um, because otherwise they don't work at all. So in Eric Fair's famous experiment in nature, uh, it was a three to one number, it's a third. That number will be a third. Um, high error rates, now error rates here are what you have to pay in the long run to be a punisher. So uh, for the whole 25 interactions, um, uh, on average, 10% of the guys who mean to cooperate, they're trying to cooperate, they know they're going to be punished if they don't cooperate, they know it pays to cooperate, but um, they mistakenly defect, and then they have to be punished. Um, so the higher the error rate, the more costly it is to be a punisher, and as you'd expect, um, uh, if we make 20%, we get less cooperation. If we make it 1%, which a lot of people think, have said to me, is a more reasonable number, then you get a lot more cooperation and a lot more punishment. Longer interactions, that gives you more time to benefit from the induced cooperation, and so therefore you get more punishment. Um, <coughs> so let me take a, a dig here at Laurent Lehman and, and colleagues, um, who I'm kind of irritated with, but um, uh, uh, that's actually that's a slightly attractive gloss on what I actually feel about Laurent, but anyway, um, uh, uh, so they assume cooperation is an inherited trait, not a choice. And this is hidden, basically, in all their models. They assume that selection is so weak that when you, when you write down relatednesses, or alternatively, the amount of variation between groups, you can do that ignoring selection. So it's just migration and drift that do the work. And that means that punishment is not inducing, it's not changing the frequency of cooperation in the groups that the punishers are in. Uh, it, does, it has effects on the global population, but it doesn't affect the amount of variation in cooperators among groups. And as a consequence, this whole system of punishing, being a deterrent, creating cooperative individuals, and those groups do better, can't work in their models. And so this is an extreme version. Not only isn't cooperation linked, it's completely contingent on the social environment. It's not, it doesn't evolve at all. It's a choice. Okay, uh, I'll be finished now. Just a couple of problems. Your problem is, um, oh no, um, first problem is, is there a ratchet? You, so uh, small amounts of, val guys with low values of tau, low thresholds can get in when, with small amounts of relatedness. Would you, th can you then imagine that it would bump up ratchet-wise from larger and larger values of tau. Um, the answer with unrelated groups, randomly formed groups, is no, for sure. Uh, higher values of tau are always selected. Um, I haven't been able to do the calculation yet for relatedness, but I think if you make relatedness high enough, it's going to generate a, a ratchet where you jump up one tau after the other. Um, what about bad guys who punish uh, defectors but don't themselves cooperate? Seems likely that they could come in. Uh, and then that brings in problems of coalitions, because then you would, might think there might be several different groups of people who might want to do that. Interesting to think about, hard to model. Um, this is your question. Uh, I think it's a really important question. Errors and variation in, in tau, I think, could, uh, are very important to look at, because everything hangs so much on being in that threshold group. <coughs> and finally, um, I worry about the scale economies in, at larger values of n. Um, so basically, the model assumes that um, it, uh, each defector is taken out by themselves one at a time, and they confront the however many punishers there are, and they're punished, and then the next guy comes in the door and is, is punished. And you might think that that would lead to diseconomies if there were enough guys that needed to be punished, and that's not in the model. Either. OK, so questions? Oh, I have to say, I, I put this in to make fun of Martin Novak. Um, uh, these are uh, woodcuts that I got from a, a book about uh, uh, life in 18th century, uh, 17th century New England. Um, and it's all the punishments that were available to, to, for people who were bad. So there's whipping at the, ca at the cart's tails. They tie you to the back of the cart and, and beat you with a cat of nine tails. Uh, the dunking stool, that's sort of um, waterboarding, 16, 17th century style. You can be branded or you can be put in the pillory. And so um, I told Martin, I thought that the people must be a lot nicer in Cambridge now than they were uh, in 1670. Okay, thanks very much. Simon.
thought about what happens if you have a lot of different groups with uh, different structures and you have some movement. So it's her, kind of, yes. It's just, uh, for example, a, a low relatedness group would provide a, a source from which uh, individuals could go out. Mm -hmm. Individuals' movements also might be uh, affected by, they, you, know, you may move into a low relatedness group. Or move into a high, well. Well, I mean, there, there'd be a benefit to you to move into a low relatedness group, right? Because you get an advantage. Um, well, you get an advantage. Pardon? Yeah, so all the relatedness here are really low. It's not enough to sustain. Yeah. yeah. Uh, um, so we have a simulation um, that is a much more realistic simulation that has populations. Uh, it's a, it's a um, um, island model kind of population. Uh, 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 there's a population regulation at the, at, on islands. Uh, individuals move back and forth. They're born into islands a certain direction. It's a typical kind of, you know, uh, uh, Taylor style um, um, model. Uh, except, in order to do so, and the reason we're interested in that is a little different from the reason that you're interested in it. I can tell you it behaves pretty much the same as this one. Um, uh, so, the we were, we were interested in it because this first period is kind of weird, right, from a, from a real life point of view. There aren't first periods, right? So in the simulation, these groups just go on, and each time somebody moves in, everybody counts. We still know there's enough punishers, okay? And if there are, then we keep cooperating. But if, if this new guy puts us into a situation where we might not have enough, then everyone signals. If he doesn't signal, then cooperation collapses. Um, it, it's quite relevant to your question because now, it, it, it matters not just whether you're at the threshold, but if you're a couple above. What's the new person's tab? The new person may not destabilize things, whereas if you're exactly at the threshold, you get back to the signal. Right? So uh, you get a kind of, it's not exactly the same result. But qualitatively, you have two equilibria. Um, the, the bottom equilibria with the size population you're using, which is 10,000, um, drift gets you out of there reasonably quickly. Yeah. So, you never stay there forever. The other equilibrium is much stable, much more stable. Um, we don't look at heterogeneity in migration rates or group sizes, which is what we need to do to answer your question. And we definitely don't look at, at contingent migration. So I uh, basically don't know the answer, but um, I mean, I mean, we're assuming migration rates that are so high. So even in the simulation, that the, that the back that the relatednesses are quite low. So we're we're trying to get to hunter-gatherer kind of relatedness. So there's not much room for, for anything like that. Sort of relatedly, I'm curious about um, the fact that you're holding cost constant. And so I'm curious about that. Cost of cooperating or cost of punishing? Cost of punishing, good. Because if you didn't hold it constant and it's a recursive model, then like, I mean, you would almost be able to model formalization Yeah. I'm just wondering, and maybe it's because it's hunter gatherer, and you really do see that every single instance of the, the raid is a whole new something of the territory, of, and you know, therefore the costs really are equal. But or is it, you know, I'm the guy who's punishing every time, and so my costs actually are lower because. Well, so the total cost, the, the total cost is always constant in the way, so it doesn't matter who's punishing. The, the total, all, only question is, no, that's not true. So it, 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 there's two things going on. So time is a scale. And then the total cost, the sort of base cost. And the more guys you have, the total cost goes down according to time and scale. We don't let that vary at all. Um, I have to have, I mean, I haven't thought about it. You need some principled way to make the, the cost decline. Well, I guess, I mean, just from what you know ethnographically of the population, is it really a, a fresh choice every time? Or are there pre existing assumptions and roles that people play that might actually be affecting? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, there's a lot of things in here. There's a lot of things in real life that happen in the mall. That's all this. Uh, 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 that's right. So, as you know, it's, if there's some organization that has, so some guy's got to take charge. So, this guy that got beaten for for um, breaking into the, to the nurses' station and stealing alcohol, uh, they had to decide who would actually do the beating, and that took a certain amount of negotiation. Uh, it could be that 
that would lead, there would lead to you know the other police and so forth. Semi-formal roles so forth, or, or would make that cheap. None of that's in the model. Um, the other thing which is not in the model, which I think is is kind of along the same lines, is this idea of legitimacy. So um, uh, one of the things that's really clear about punishment. is this idea that legitimacy is important. So that um, you're a person who did something wrong. You're a coward. A um, bunch, bunch of your age mates get together and they tie you a tree and beat you up and demand that you slaughter a cow and have a feast. Um, that's completely legitimate. No one will say anything bad about any of us. won't cost us anything in terms of social reputation, in terms of long-term interactions in society. If you're a perfectly normal person, you haven't been a coward and we tie you a tree and beat you up story of how from you. That's not legitimate at all. And uh, I think that's so so the revealing all the problems of this story. But uh, I mean, nobody's asking this yet, but somebody should be thinking this. Well why don't four or five other guys get together and punch back? You know, or, and, and say, you know, if you punch me, I'm gonna punch you, so you know, fuck off, basically. And uh, um, this I think has to do with legitimacy that if they punish back that's not legitimate, they lose social capital. And, uh, but the legitimate fund, if we agree that cowardice is bad, or that not sharing food is bad, or whatever it is, the norms that we're enforcing, um, none of that's in here. This is, this is a, a, a you know, well done. Yeah. Uh, sort of two separate related questions. So <coughs> um, what about uh, in cases where it's not, you know, it's not apparent who's affected, and then you have this this Fairness. aspect of of surveillance, like yeah. cost of surveillance. Yeah. Uh, so I'm kind of wondering about that. And uh, separately, um, what about sort of this additional benefit of punishment being that people's people don't uh, defect because of like imagined punishment? You know? Yeah. Well, okay. So we're gonna hear about religion later. Maybe we'll hear about that. But so let me ask the first question, which I can actually say something concrete about. Um, the second question, uh, you know, there's this idea, well, let me answer the second question. There's this idea that, that you know, um, if you're worried about spending eternity in a burning tomb, uh, to take an example from Christian um, uh, beliefs about to the afterlife, um, uh, then maybe you'll be a little more careful in, in real life. Um, I've written some stuff about that. But that's, that requires a whole, another whole other world of, of assumptions and, and you have to have some reason why people would believe such things. And, and so I guess I would just like to put that off the table for a second. I, I think you can understand that in sort of, in terms of selection processes, actually and cultural variation, but it's a completely different kind of process than this one. Um, the, the question about monitoring versus punishment is a very important one. So in models with, uh, in which there's a second order free rider problem, there's a huge difference between monitoring and punishment. So, Punishment is something that you only have to pay for when somebody defects. So that means that as punishers get common and defectors get rare, um, uh, punishment gets cheaper and cheaper and cheaper. And if there's no errors, in the limit it's zero. And then you have these funny knife edge equilibria, um, uh, which I don't think are very realistic. But, but uh, monitoring is just like a high error rate, right, if it's costly. Costly monitoring, you have to pay every time no matter what. And so that makes it much more like regular cooperation and the, and the asymmetry between punishment and cooperation disappears. They, they become very similar to each other. None of that applies here because there's no second order free rider problem. I mean, it would just be an additional cost associated with, uh, ongoing cost associated with punishment like punishing errors, and it would just depend on whether the cost and benefits balanced out. But you wouldn't have this structural difference between punishment and, um, and uh, uh, monitoring. Did I understand, if I understand correctly, yeah. uh, in a punishment equilibrium, the only people who are ever punished are people who are actually innocent? Or? No, no. Uh, the first generation, um, the only way you convince a non punisher to cooperate is to punish. So you can make a model in which the non punishers pay attention to the signal, just like the punisher. Um, and then you're in a world like the one you described. No one's ever punished except for innocent slaves. Okay. But that world is way too easy. 
because I mean, you can get tons of punishment very properly and very easily. And I don't think it's very realistic because right. the ancestral so, yeah, step. Okay. 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 So, but let me understand why this problem isn't that. Because during the first period, all the, the non punishers yeah. uh, are punished for actions of death. And the only reason they cooperate is because they associate being a defecting group that they haven't been punished. So that's the first period. Then there's a and after that, they unless there's been unless they get some further information, for example, there was a liar in the first period, okay. and okay. They, they they now know there aren't gonna be enough punishes the next time, then they all defect. They're all well they're not punished then because there aren't enough punishes there aren't enough punishes to do the job. Everybody. Oh well yeah, that's